I really appreciate this uh, great turnout here at the Champion Plan today. Um, I, driving over here, I wasn't sure if the word celebrate is the right word to use, mm -hmm. but I, we're at least recognizing three years of great work uh, that's being done here. And I want to make sure, and I don't know if I can see them all, um, we'll mention a few statistics today, but the Champion Plan is really about people. It's not about statistics. Oh, there we go. A little louder? Yeah. I'll try it a little bit more. There we go. Let's go with this. So the Champion Plan is about people. It's not about statistics. And we've got some people here, and we've got some great partners in the program, but I just want to make sure I personally thank uh, Peg, Michelle, and Mary Lou, who are the people here doing the hard work every day. I come by once in a while to take the credit, but they're the ones here actually doing the work. So, um, and, and it's, it's incredible, life-saving work that they do here every day. Um, we also have an important announcement that we're going to get to in a few minutes also, but I do have a couple folks I want to introduce. I do want to talk about the Champion Plan just for a moment or two. Okay. Hang on for one second. Representative Cronin, how are you? Thank you for coming. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. But I do have to mention the numbers and a little bit about the work that's being done here and what's, what's been accomplished over the past three years. Um, over 1,100 placements into treatment, benefiting over 700 individuals. Think about how many placements into treatment that is and how many folks have been able to benefit by the fact that they could walk into the Brockton Police Station and simply ask for some help. And that happens. I gave you a plug earlier, Peg. I don't know if you heard it. So, all right. Peg and Michelle and Mary Lou just came in, so I want to make sure that uh, we recognize them. Um, but, you know, when we launched this three years ago, and we as us with a lot of great partners, um, we really didn't know what to expect. We'd spent some time putting it together with the the Mayor's Opioid Task Force. We thought uh, it was going to be great, but you know we were one of the first ones really jumping in to police-assisted recovery. And um, the experience has been really interesting because I think some of the things we feared never materialized, and there's probably been a couple challenges we hadn't thought of that did. Um, but. When I think about what this program means, b beyond just the, the families and, and, the, and the folks that we're trying to assist, um, what, the, what a difference this program has made here in Brockton and, and how we're, I think we have changed the game here in the last three years in terms of uh, stigma and people accessing treatment and being able to get to treatment. And I think a big part of that is around reducing barriers. I think one of the things the Champion Plan has done is made it easier to get to where we, we want folks to be able to get to. So transportation is a barrier. It's a barrier to getting people into treatment. Brewster Ambulance has been an incredible partner to us. And not only does it help us get folks from here to there, but I think that, that Peg and her team would tell you that it also opened us up to many more potential partners all over the state. So maybe today we can't get that bed in Brockton or Plymouth, but we can get it in Westboro or Worcester. And because of the fact that it doesn't matter where the bed is, so long as it's in Massachusetts, Brewster Ambulance will get them to it. And so it's made us so much more effective, I think, in being able to find that place uh, for someone to go and, and increasing access because that person here on their own may be just trying to get into High Point, and that's their only option. If they can't get in there, they can't get anywhere else. But yet here, with the team here, with the relationships that they've built with providers across the entire state, and with the transportation help from Brewster, we really can access almost any bed in the state that we can find. And the result of that, and this is one of the biggest surprises to me, is waiting time when someone comes into the program. Um, that was one of the things I was really worried about coming in, that, that, that we would, the demand would exceed the capacity, what do we do if someone's got to stay overnight, all of those things, and quite the opposite has happened. These guys have gotten so good 
and develop so many relationships that the wait time is mind-boggling. Now, for this current year, I know it was under an hour last year. Is it still under an hour? Half an hour? The average wait time this year in the Champion Plan, the average to access treatment was 30 minutes. It's, it's unbelievable. I couldn't do one telephone intake in 30 minutes, let alone find someone that's going to work with us. And I think that really goes to the people that are here working, the relationships, and I just, and I can't name them all off the top of my head, but to all of our treatment partners that are working with us, that are sharing the mission with us and, and helping us help others. Um, we, we couldn't do it without our partners. Um, three years has gone by fast, but for myself personally, I think the, the biggest change that I've seen is the change in perceptions. And I know perceptions are changing in general, and we are step by step getting rid of stigma. But if you think about one of the things we were most concerned about when we designed this in police-assisted recovery was, are we going to be able to convince folks to walk into the police station? Were we going to be able to get over that hurdle? Because the reality is that, you know, most folks that are struggling have probably had some type of negative interaction with the police department somewhere along the line. And we were worried, could, were we going to convince those same folks to trust us and trust the police to walk into the police station without fear of being arrested and actually being gaining access to treatment. And so I think a process that began five years ago, shortly after becoming mayor, I asked all of our first responders, police and fire, to carry Narcan. That was a, a very f small first step. But I think that began, particularly on the police side, changing the perception of police officers, of people who are struggling with addiction, and also changing people that are struggling with substance use disorders, how they feel about the police department. That was a very big first step, because I don't think you can save someone's life today and not care about what happens to them tomorrow. I just don't think you can. And the champion plan is saving lives too. But now I think that's multiplied by 10 now that people struggling with substance use disorders are actually trusting the police and thankful that they're there to help connect them to services. And I think that I, I, I've seen a change in perception of folks struggling from police officers who had spent their entire career being trained to arrest anyone in possession of drugs. And now, I don't say the police officers say it, but if I were talking to someone, I'd say, make sure you're not in possession of drugs when you walk in the police station. Um, but that whole change in approach and the change from just, we're going to just keep arresting you to, you know what, the arresting part isn't working, and, and we're, going to help you get, we're going to help you get some help. And we actually have police officers who carry around business cards that have the champion plan information on it. And I've seen them dozens and dozens of times hand it to someone and just say, when you're ready, if you're not coming in today, when you're ready, come see us. We'll get you in somewhere. And people do take them up on it. And that's how a lot of the folks end up here. So I think the changing in perceptions has been incredible. I think also that we've got to be, uh, I'm very conscious of the fact that whatever progress and success we've made in the last three years, that we're not satisfied with it. Um, the challenge has gotten bigger, not smaller, in the last three years. And I think that we can't be afraid to keep pushing the envelope to see how we can do more. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot lately about how we now need partners from residential treatment programs and, 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 you know, this continuum of care. So the recovery coaches have been such a key here because everyone has a recovery coach that comes through the program, and that recovery coach is a person who cares, a person who gets it, and a person who's going to continue reaching out to that person periodically for a year. And that's made a big difference in being able to motivate and help folks keep their head in the game to be willing to get away from this spin-dry detox cycle and actually agree to continue on to, to, to future programs. 
And we've had great success so far, but now I feel like changes have come in the state recently in terms of licensing uh, sober living spaces, and, and I think we, we're going to have to embrace that more and, and, and really have a more active role in that. But I think probably the change I'm most excited about that's, that's happening right now is up until now, everything with the Champion Plan was based upon a person walking in and asking. That was the whole premise. One of the reasons why it works, because we've got that person right at that moment in time that they're receptive. Um, but that's not good enough either. So I think we, and, and working with a couple different partners, uh, with, the, with the RISE grant, uh, we now are starting to do outreach. We're actually now putting people out on the street, helping to identify folks that could use our help and positioning them and trying to motivate them and making sure they know how to get here um, and reassuring them that the path is there and even keeping track of them to try to, if it's not going to happen today, beginning to build the relationships, we might be able to make it happen next week or next month. And sometimes that takes some relationship building before that happens. Um, and also with, with our police department, you know, we've, reached, we've recently received a federal grant, and a, a portion of that grant, LIFT, not LIFT, is it LIFT? Link. Link, thank you. I get it wrong every time. Link Up Brockton, which is a, a combined strategy, and I won't bore you with the whole thing, addressing both gun violence and substance use disorders. Um, but an important component of that is police officers in civilian clothing with iPads walking through neighborhoods, identifying people in need of services and helping to identify them, see what they need, and use the champion plan and police-assisted recovery to get them to the help that they need. And so, I mean, this is, this is revolutionary for our program because for three years it's been about people coming to us, but now we're going out to people, both with clinicians and social workers, but also with police officers, because I think we've expanded this relationship to the point where A, the cops can do a really good job at it, and B, I think people are receptive to it, and they understand that, that, that the approach is different now. Um, so it's an exciting time for us in terms of what we can continue to do, um, but I'm constantly reminded daily as to the size and scope of this public health crisis and the fact that people are still dying every day. And myself personally, in the last two weeks, I've lost young men that I've known since they were children and children of friends of mine. And <clears throat> continuing to go to wakes and funerals is just getting really old and watching lives wasted. And just, I say kids, they're both about 30 years old, but I've known them since they were kids. And it just, we've got to get the corner turned on this thing. We've, we've got to stop, and we've got to get to the point where, you know, I have to break the news to Pagan or people that we don't need them anymore. Um, and I, I'm hoping that I'm here long enough to, to see that happen. Um, I am very appreciative of everybody that's here. We do have several elected officials here. I want to make sure I mention them. Uh, State Rep. Claire Cronin, uh, thanks so much, Claire, for being here. And Claire, your district, I think, really highlights what's unique about this challenge. Claire represents both Easton and Brockton. And the reality is it doesn't matter whether you live in Easton or Brockton. This is the same fight, the same change. You're just as dead if your family came from Easton or Brockton. And we've got, to, we've, we've got to realize that and all be working together and having the chiefs from Plymouth and East Bridgewater here today um, I think really accentuates the fact that we are taking this on on a regional basis and we are all working together and we are sharing information and we're all trying to help each other with additional resources because we realize that's the only way this is going to work. But uh, Representative Cronin, thank you for being here. Representative Michelle Dubois from Brockton is also here. From the school committee, uh, Tim Sullivan from Ward 7 is here with us. And uh, Jim, if you don't mind making a couple brief remarks, um, Jim Cantwell from Senator Markey's office, uh, the Senator's Massachusetts director, is here. And 
I first got to know Senator Markey just a few weeks after becoming mayor when he held a, uh, he held a, I'm not sure what we would call it. He brought a group of folks together down in Taunton that included the drug czar for the whole country and brought both law enforcement and local governments together to really coordinate our response. And it was right, at, right when the, the number of overdoses was exploding. And since that time, you know, Senator Markey, I can personally tell you, has been a great leader and a champion on this issue. Anytime we've gone to him for assistance, he's always been there for us. And uh, he's tied up down in D.C., but my good friend Jim Cantwell is here, so I invite Jim up to say a couple words on behalf of the senator. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And, and Mr. Mayor, you also uh, are being very... Uh, I think humble in, in discussing your role here because the first time I met Mayor Carpenter was when we came up with Joe Schrand and we're talking about just some of the deaths that you had seen and as a school committee member when you were saying we need to do something about it and with the leadership of people like Claire Cronin, uh, who the, the chairperson who just heralded through criminal justice reform, making sure we had many resources for those who are going through the throes of addiction. And Michelle Dubois, who I know is here, Jerry Cassidy, Senator Mike Brady, who would have been here, but he was at a funeral for a, a former mayor uh, of Brockton. We're here, and Mr. Mayor, you were saying you didn't want to call it a, a celebration, but we definitely are here for a success story. And as uh, Senator Markey says often, uh, that success has a thousand mothers and fathers. Defeat is an orphan. And we're lucky here that we have not quite a thousand people, but a packed room to talk about the success just of the Champion program. Chief John Crowley, it's a pleasure to, to have you, seeing you here again, Chief Michael Poteri, Chief Scott Allen, showing three police chiefs who fought so much against the stigma of addiction to say we'd much rather, we can't arrest our way out of this problem, we want to help people ahead of time and have people come to the front door of your stations first instead of having to come around the back being arrested. Seeing so many people walking leaders in prevention, treatment, long-term recovery. I saw Joanne Peterson, who first came in from Learned to Cope. Uh, Joanne Peterson, because of her tremendous work, uh, Senator Markey brought uh, Joanne to the State of the Union several years ago to say we need to fight against addiction, we need to fight against stigma. Let me say on behalf of Senator Markey, by the way, Senator Markey's wife on his first date, Senator Markey's wife, Dr. Susan, Susan Blumenthal, uh, told him that she was the director of SAMHSA. Now, for those of you who don't know what SAMHSA is, she told him right there was Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and that he needed to dedicate his career to help those who were in the throes of addiction, and that he does. He's listened, and he's done that through and through. <laughs> so on behalf of Senator Markey, one, Peg, Michelle, Mary Lou, thank you. I know we'll have to, every person coming up speaking should be able to mention just the great work that you've done. On behalf of the state delegation, I don't know if the state delegation is speaking, but, but they, they are all been tremendous partners, both to Senator Markey as well as here to the city. I uh, do want to add just things that Senator Markey has been advocating for after learning, uh, Mr. Mayor, from your tremendous work, from Claire Cronin, from Michelle Dubois, and for others. We now have national legislation that was passed because of the work uh, that's being done here in Massachusetts, expanding addiction treatment access and improvement, uh, eliminating opioid-related diseases, trying to have more assistance to folks who may have other diseases that come from injections, uh, looking for national milestones. We spend 97 percent of the money that we spend right now, both federally and in the state, is going to try to help people after they've become addicted. It's so important to have long-term recovery and treatment access, as you have, Mr. Mayor, you said 1,100 people in the last year alone. My goodness, my goodness. Uh, but we also want to make sure that as we spend those funds that we, we have proven uh, determination of what's been most effective. This champion program certainly is one of those. So on behalf of Senator Ed Markey, uh, Mr. Mayor, we want to pledge our continued partnership. We thank you for your leadership. Thank you for the leadership of Claire Cronin, Mike Brady, Jerry Cassidy, and Michelle Dubois. All of you are here. Thank you so very much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. So <clears throat> I just noticed when I stepped aside that Henry's here. So when we talk about partners, one of our most important partners and, and someone that's been with us from the days we were talking about how do we start something like this uh, has been the Gandhara Center and their CEO, uh, Henry East True, is right over here. If you could say hello to him. So. <laughs> to the extent that in our first year of existence, they were gracious enough to share their space with us because we didn't have any space at the time. And they actually let us uh, use their space uh, as our home for the first year, and they continue to be a great supporting partner. Um, 
police assisted recovery doesn't work without the police department and we've got some some really outstanding people with us uh, but the person who really um, has made the champion plan work at the police department is uh, Lieutenant Dick Linehan. So I want to invite Lieutenant Linehan up to say a couple words. You've hit all the subjects I was going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> the foundation for the champion plan was laid three years ago, and that's been built upon in many different ways. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning. Introducing the champion plan to the police officers out in the street, and me being one that's out in the street, and hoping that the buy-in would take place, shocked me. Shocked me that an officer could lock someone up that's suffering from substance use disorder, and on their way to the station with handcuffs on and their hands behind their back, they're explaining recovery and where they can go to get it. Parties booked in, go over to the courthouse, released on personal, and some did come back to join the champion plan. That's outstanding work, outstanding work. Part of the criteria when you come into the station is you do a warrant check. Warrant check done, the party, if they do have a warrant, they are going to get locked up. It's a shall arrest thing. They wanted the champion plan. They did get locked up on their warrant. As of today, three years into this, 100% has come back after they were bailed out after they went over to court. <clears throat> That's outstanding. That's because we also have the help at the, court, at the courthouse. The drug, we have a drug court in Brockton. Uh, there's going to be a speaker coming up that is a graduate from the drug court. Another outstanding program, uh, the road is, it's a hard road. There's many bumps in it. Um, it's an 18-month 18, an 18 commitment. However, if you, if you hit one of those bumps, you, that 18 months could grow a little bit higher. And I'm not going to steal any more thunder from that. Building upon that uh, foundation, the net was cast over Brockton. Well, that net has now gone to Plymouth County. We have a Plymouth County outreach. Every department in Plymouth County to include Bridgewater State University, if someone overdoses in that territory and they're from that county, an officer and a peer is going to be knocking on that door to speak not only to the client, the person that's suffering, but also their family. That's outstanding work. We had, we're fortunate here in Brockton that we have an officer that's 40 hours commitment to that, which he needs that 40, 40 hours of commitment to do those follow-ups, to make sure he's letting the neighboring communities know that one of their citizens has overdosed in Brockton so that follow-up can be done. And the rest of it, the mayor said, outstanding work, Peg. It's without your foundation, without your caring, without Brewster's partnership. I'm not sure if this program could work as effectively. Brewster, I, I, can't, I can't appreciate you enough. Transporting anybody across anywhere in, the, in Massachusetts to get them to that recovery that they need. Quickly, do I have another moment for a quick story? Knocked on someone's door, told them if you didn't go into recovery, that would be kicking your door in at 4 in the morning. And then we're going to come in with a search warrant. That party came to the station. Uh, she asked for assistance through the champion plan. She came through the champion doors. Anxiety took over. She had to leave the champion doors. But within weeks later, she went into recovery. That recovery road was two strong years of recovery two strong years of recovery to the point that that beautiful person is in this room and she's opened her own sober house with 14 beds. <clears throat> Outstanding. Five years ago, the mayor and I, myself, the chief, we went out to Gloucester. We sat down, we spoke, we came back. The miracle worker wanted this to be much larger than we could do it at first, but we have an outstanding program, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hang on just one second. Huh? So 
So I appreciate those comments, Lieutenant. And, and that, that was one of the big, uh, one of our big fears when we started is what's going to happen when someone has a warrant. And why we were so concerned about it is the police explained to us that what happens when someone has a warrant is they're taken into custody because there's no other option. Um, but, and, and the lieutenant left a little bit out, the relationship that he's built over at the courthouse through the drug court and through working with the people over there every week has allowed us to, to have an understanding and a working relationship with the court that they understand that if someone's ready for champion plan, um, so long as it's, you know, with the exception of a couple types of, of charges, <laughs> protective orders and, and gun violence, but with only a couple of exceptions, if the person's ready to go to treatment, they process them, they get them in, they get them out, they give them a chance on personal recognizance to go in and get the treatment. Because if anyone understands it as well as anyone, it's the folks at the courthouse and, and the folks at the police department. And so it's really bringing all those folks together to realize that, you know, the best thing we can do today is, is find this person a place to go if they're willing to go. Um, so we have an important announcement today uh, because we, uh, as the champion plan, so I say we, I mean the collective we, uh, we have decided uh, to join a great national organization called PARI. PARI is an acronym for Police Assisted, Police Assisted Addiction Recovery Initiative. And they represent, how many now, uh, you'll, you'll say when you got the alley, yeah. Almost 500 police departments across the country that they're working with now with what is essentially the same model. And I know at different places they may be doing it a little bit differently, but the basic model is the same. Walk into the police station and ask for help. And uh, we've had an opportunity to, to get to know each other a little bit, um, but Allie is the um, executive director of PARI. She does incredible work. We've crossed paths at a number of conferences and, and of the sort. And I think it's really our relationship with Allie has brought us to believe that the right thing for the champion to do now is to be part of this national organization, sharing resources. We think we've got some good things to share with other departments. And we also know there's plenty that we don't know that we can learn from working with other departments. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Allie Hunter McDade, the Executive Director of Harry. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here um, and to show our support for this vital project. Um, I have the privilege of serving as PARI's executive director, and like many of you, I'm called to this work because it hits close to home, and I have a loved one who's in recovery with an opioid use disorder. So PARI, the Police Assisted Addiction and Recovery Initiative, is a movement of nearly 500 police departments in 32 states, police departments who believe in treatment, not jail. And we were founded just over three years ago in Gloucester, Massachusetts, with the simple but significant recognition that police have a front row seat to the opioid epidemic, and they're uniquely positioned to help people take their first steps in their recovery journey. So what we do is we provide technical assistance, capacity building, recovery coaching, and any other resource that we can, we can find to help support police departments and cities as they address the opioid epidemic through non-arrest strategies. Um, so in our work with hundreds of cities across the country, we've seen that these proactive policing programs are not only saving lives, but they're reducing crime and they're improving police community relations and they're changing the national conversation about how to address addiction. So um, Mayor Carpenter, the city of Brockton, Brockton Police Department, as you all know, um, have such a deep commitment to assisting community members who are struggling with a substance use disorder. And so I'm just honored to be here today to celebrate this important milestone and really thrilled that Brockton is going to be officially joining PARI and we'll work together more closely to provide national leadership and help replicate this model not only across the Commonwealth but across the entire country. So, you know, you all know that the Champion Plan's already made such a lasting impact on hundreds of lives, and I'm just thrilled to be here um, and help continue that work and help change many more lives. So, thank you. Oh, th thank you, Allie. It's, it's, it's great for us to be officially partnered with you and working with you now, and, and uh, it's exciting for us for the Champion Plan to be part, part of PARI. You know, I mentioned in my opening remarks, the Champion Plan is not about statistics, it's about people. And it's about not just individuals, because every person who walks through here is someone's son, daughter, sister, brother, mother, father. Um, 
but also the fact that I think that to really explain to you what the champion plan can mean in someone's life, uh, I'm not capable of doing that, uh, not, not very well anyhow. So we, um, we've invited uh, Jonathan to come up and share his story with you. Uh, he is uh, celebrating over two years of sobriety. And uh, yeah, congratulations, Jonathan. And I think Jonathan is just one example, but when you meet Jonathan, you'll wonder, you'll, you'll realize why we all keep showing up to make this work every day. So Jonathan, come on up. Oh, I am so nervous to be up here. Uh, okay. Well, first, I, I have to thank the Champion Plan and the Mayor for all they've done. You know, um, just to give you some background on myself, um, I'm coming to LHI, which is now. S oh. Jonathan's a lot taller than I am. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> I shrink. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure I don't get <clears throat> um, Well, just to give you some background on myself, I've been coming to what is now known as Stairway to Recovery, which was LHI when I first walked through these doors. You know. um, it's where I got my start in my recovery, and I, I was able to come to the acknowledgement that I'm not alone in my struggles. <clears throat> a little over two years ago, I walked into the police station on a Sunday and asked for help. And, oh, give me a second, to ask for help because I had reached a place that scared me and wasn't sure how to go about. And Miss Peg came over to get me right before Stairway was getting ready to close. But that didn't matter to this amazing woman. She spent the next few hours trying to find me a bed. And by the grace of God, she did. But I wasn't ready yet. A, later, a year later, I made my way back here again. But this time, I thought I would stay. But once again, I did not. But that didn't stop the amazing team here from checking in on me. Through phone calls, texts, it didn't matter. They found ways to reach me. And if they couldn't reach me, they reached out to my family to try and help me that way. Then I got clean for a little bit, and I fell back off. And they were there once again to help. But I wasn't ready yet. And that's how I became a participant in Brockton's Drug Court. And they were there through all of that. And now I have over two years clean. And I still come in to check in and give them updates on my, you know, what I'm doing, what's going on, and just to ask for help sometimes. And just to come in occasionally to get a pat on my back, because we need that. You know, and they're there all the time to remind me of my accomplishments and how proud they are of me. And I am thankful every day for this program and the things they've done for me and the people they've introduced me to. Like, there are so many people in this room that have been an effective a part of my recovery, from Bamsey, from the mayor's office, stairway. I've been through so many different programs and facilities and learned that there are actual people out here who aren't my family who care about me. And that's something we struggle with in our addiction when we're out there. You know, we know our families are supposed to care about us, but we don't realize there are other people in this world that care as well. And the fact that they're still here in my corner years later, no matter things I've done and haven't done, they stand by me, even though I'm years past the program dates, they still call and check on me because they truly care. And that's what these programs are meant to do. And I can only thank you guys so much. <laughs> so much right now. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for sharing. Uh, thank you for sharing the story. And I just think his story just makes a lot of points that we see every day with the champion plan. You know, the one statistic I gave you was over 1,100 admissions to treatment, over 700 unique individuals served. Clearly, some people come through more than once. And for people who don't understand what's going on here, they think that sounds like a negative, like we don't, 
you know, we don't snap our fingers and, and help people be sober for the rest of their lives overnight. The reality is the fact that people like Jonathan come back, that's the success story. That's the fact that they were treated with respect by the police department. They were helped by loving, caring people here. They didn't make it the first time. So we're going to help them make it the second time or the third time. Because one thing we never do is we never give up on anybody. So if they walk in here or they walk through the police station expressing a desire to be sober, then that's the only requirement. And it doesn't matter if you're from Brockton or not from Brockton. Half the people that come through the, I'm not going to use exact statistics, <laughs> but half the people who come through the Champion Plan are not Brockton residents. It's a regional approach here. We know that a lot of folks in the Metro South area, when they're struggling, may end up in Brockton. And that's why this is such a natural place for this program to be. Um, nearly half the people that come in here um, describe themselves as having been homeless on the night before they came in. It's not unusual. Um, and, and Jonathan alluded to a little bit, but sometimes for some folks that have been struggling for a long time, um, they view this as a last chance. Because when someone's struggling with a substance use disorder, their whole family is struggling too. And it takes a tremendous toll on loved ones. And sometimes families give up. They can't take it anymore and they give up. And that person knows that they can still come here. And part of the mission is reuniting people with their families. So I thank you all so much for being here. Uh, it's an exciting day for us to become part of PARI. It's an exciting day for us to, to mark uh, over 1,100 admissions into treatment. And we just ask everyone here, all of our partners here, to, to keep working with us and, and help us keep this mission going so that we can continue to, uh, to help people. Thank you.